What's up guys, this is Pi with SRLounge.com and today we have Kwong Lee in the studio today. Thank you so much for coming out, dude. Yeah, of course. It's awesome to, to I guess, be here. I guess it's cool to, that you guys reached out. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we came across this Kwong's work just uh, fairly recently, actually, and you do amazing, incredible work. And it's hard, to, it's hard to classify exactly what type of work you do. I mean, it's very fashion-inspired, editorial, commercial. I mean, it's all kind of a mixture. So I don't know if you've kind of, I don't know if you have a classification for yourself or you just kind of... <laughs> Do whatever feels comes it, to you. It's sort of just kind of what comes to mind. It's it's a lot of it is just kind of inspired by just stuff I do every day. Um, you know, I, I kind of had a lot of trouble. I think it took me about five years of shooting to actually call myself a photographer. Uh -huh. And even like I think it on one of my social networking things, Instagram or Facebook, it says I just take pictures <laughs> like a pic, I'm a picture taker because I like. You know, it's not something I went to school for. It was just something that sort of happened, and yeah. and I don't. I feel like the title photographer has like such like presence and like pageantry, and I just, I don't know. Maybe when well, I grow up, I'll I'll decide that it's okay. Like <laughs> like we'll just say picture taker for right now. Well, he's an incredible picture taker, and we're gonna show you guys some of his images. But uh, you work for a lot of really big companies. I mean, Skull Candy. Uh, can you name a few of them? Um. Yeah, I've worked. My the first job I actually ever had was this for this company called Ruka uh -huh. um and and Pat Tenore um kind of just dis discovered me is that the right way we were, <laughs> we were just friends and he had liked my photos and, and a, a gal named Liz Rice was working there as well and and they sort of convinced me to do it and at the time I was studying film history at Cal State Fullerton and you know they convinced me to start taking photos for them so I started with them and then moved on to other co companies like Skull Candy, LRG, mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, it, it's like it, Creative Recreation. I've done stuff with Vans, Nike. Yeah. Um, uh, who else? It's, it's there's a lot, lots of bands. Snoop Dogg, Gym Class Heroes, probably one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. Um, uh, it's very Stance, impressive. Stance Socks. I, I I love working for those guys. There's just a lot of them, and it's it's kind of weird in in this situation where I'm like. It, it like I, I space out on it but you yeah know, those are those are probably the top ones that I just have felt that like have given me a lot you yeah know? yeah and, and I hope that I've given them stuff as well that's really impressive well we we brought you in today because I wanted to talk about um, your creative direction I mean you have a really unique way of, of approaching shoots but I wanted to kind of go in before we get into that into kind of how it I mean you, you said it all started with that first company that kind of the, the guy that discovered you but did you also mentioned you didn't really intend to be a photographer. What? How did you kind of fall into this? You know, when I was younger, I was always into like going to shows and punk rock and things like that. And there's a band called the Aquabats that I was like, I know, r really into. <laughs> and um, a, a friend of mine who who worked with them, um, Parker Jacobs, who who had done a lot of art for them, and he was one of the performers and and everything. He was like a major part of it. He, he sort of brought me into the mix with those guys and I started working for them. And this was like right out of high school. That's crazy. Like I hadn't, I, you know, I, I really didn't have any idea of what I wanted to do. But so instead of the regular like go to college or, or mm -hmm. wander around or, you know, go backpacking across Europe because my family's rich or, or any of the nonsense that most kids end up doing, it's like, you know, I was this sort of like poor kid that like, went to this high school that like didn't really fit in and then when I graduated I had no idea what I was going to do and then yeah. this these guys sort of took me under their wing and um so I was touring around working for them and and they're you know if you if anybody looks them up they're very creative crazy bunch of guys they actually have a TV show that just came out called the Aquabat Super Show on the Hub channel I did not know that yeah yeah and they also, they you know and it'll it comes around where they actually had this other show that's pretty successful called Yo Gabba Gabba. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so it's like if you if you look at what they were doing, it's like that was a lot to me because it was it was sort of like all the thoughts that were running around in my mm -hmm. head. Here's a group of individuals that had like a similar like mind, and so we, we were partnered up, and in a weird way, we were like playing shows around the country. So it was like a reward, a, yeah. a reward for your insanity. Yeah. And so, you know, they sort of pushed me to the limit, you know. Um, and so I just kept thinking like that. I kept like, you know, where I feel like, you know, a lot of people out there, it's like 
people call you crazy, you know, mm-hmm. if, you, if you come up with funny stuff or anything like that. Where for me, working with them, it was just like, the more insane it got, the better. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's sort of part of the process that I apply now. It's like, I, I was working on that, doing that, and then I ended up going to school, like studying film history okay. um, at Cal State Fullerton, like I mentioned before. And then, you know, through the band, I was working with a lot of interesting creative people. The guys over at Paul Frank were a huge influence on me yeah. early on. And so I had the weirdest sort of schooling, but it wasn't school. It was just hanging out. Yeah. And then coincidentally, all these guys that I was hanging out with ended up working on like bigger, crazier things. Yeah, that's an amazing start, though, dude. I mean, a lot of people would kill for that opportunity that kind of just came to you. I mean, that was kind of through networking, basically, just kind of being around yeah, the I right mean, people. It, it, and... was, it, was, it is sort of like networking, but at the time... It wasn't like I was going to like cor- corporate mixers. It. it was yeah, like yeah. we were like skateboarding and going yeah. to shows and like like just doodling. Yeah. You know, we were going to movies. It was it was just hanging out, but basically having a group of friends that pushed each other. Yeah, yeah. Like so hard that it like it it was gonna be great no matter what. And, and even if it wasn't on a financial gain or, or having like a big popular commercial success, it was like to us. At the end of the day, I feel like I shoot a lot of stuff just so that I can, like, run up to, like, somebody else that I know or, like, somebody I respect or my mom even be like, look, look what I did. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be like, like, look at this, you know. And then if if companies or other people end up liking it, like, that's kind of bonus to me. It's yeah. like I'm, you know, I've, I come away from shoots, you know, if I'm disappointed, like, it always seems like the client's always, like, ecstatic. They love it or something. And sometimes I'm bummed. Sometimes I'm into it, but like when I'm into it, it's just like it's it's the greatest thing ever, and that's yeah. that's that's all that really ever matters to me at the end of the day. Well, and what I found really impressive about what you do is that in a lot of these roles that you've taken on, working with Skull Candy, I mean you've you've stepped kind of out of the photographer role and really more into the creative director role, uh, where you're kind of more coming up with concepts, coming up with the vision, it, and, and going that right. And that's what I want to talk about is how do you kind of do that. You know, I don't want to take anything away from, like, the creative directors I've worked with or anything, but it's like a collaboration. Mm-hmm. Like, they'll come to me because, you know, a lot of these companies have, like, I like what I what I do. Um, I'm a freelancer for the most part, but I, like, I'm very involved with the process. Mm-hmm. But I like to keep one foot in, one foot out kind of thing. Yeah. And so I kind of turn around, and when they show me their mood boards or imagery that they're inspired by or what they want to create... I can sort of tell them, like, give them a little, like, uh, I don't know, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't know if this is gonna work, or I think this is kind of lame, or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, if, if this is right, mm-hmm. um, and, and so they, you know, we come to a compromise of some mm-hmm. sort, or, or like I bring to the table other things that I'm interested in and see where, where we can meet, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like, and I think you know, all, all photographers in their own way sort of do that kind of thing. I just might have a bit of a heavier hand, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think. Well, and you've been known, I mean, I've heard some stories where basically like you've been known to kind of like go in a shoot and say, basically, if you give me the creative direction to do what I want, you know, I'll, I'll give you a better deal on my rates and stuff like that type thing where it's like you look for that freedom. Right. Well, money isn't something, you know, I, I guess I was fortunate that I come from a family where like, money like we didn't care that much because there wasn't a lot of it to go around it was like I I came from a super loving family where it was all about hanging out together yeah yeah and like you know working on stuff together taking little trips and things like that but it was you know we didn't have a lot of stuff and so come back into my real life it's like like my adult life now it's like money's cool and all but really I just want to make things Mm -hmm. you know I don't I don't like party that much I don't go to clubs it's like I sit at home and I draw like plans for my next shoot like my social gatherings are my photo shoots Mm -hmm. you know and I comprise my crew of like people that I love to be around Mm -hmm. and and that's what we do for fun if if a company allows me to sort of do whatever I want then sure it's like you're you're basically paying me to hang out yeah you know so I'm willing to, to compromise on that I'm willing to go down because I'd you know, I have a thing with a lot of my clients where I tell them, like, I'd rather do it than not do it. Yeah. You know, it's like I'd rather go out and work. Um, a really funny instance to kind of go deviate a little bit. I had once done an interview similar to this where I 
had basically told the person that I would go anywhere that I'd never been to for like fifty dollars and a breakfast burrito. Like I would take a trip and like shoot some stuff for somebody, and somebody actually took me up on it. Yeah, and they sent me out to a different country, and and it was crazy. It was an amazing trip, but you know, and I and I loved it because I didn't. I got to do what I wanted to do. Yeah, you know, as opposed to it being like, hey, we have a bunch of T-shirts we have to sell. I have a bunch of um, you know, sneakers or headphones or whatever. It's like. They were just like, do whatever you do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're hiring you to just do whatever you want because we like that. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, why not? Like, is is the paycheck really that rewarding? You know, I know a lot of photographers that shoot a lot and make tons of money and they're miserable. Mm -hmm. So, and I just felt like I can go the opposite direction. And, you know, and I do shoot stuff that, that I make. You know, I feel like I make a pretty good living off of. Yeah, you're very. That's I, what's awesome about it, is that you're successful with this approach to it. Yeah. So. You know, but I think that a lot of people, when they do come to me or they want to hire me, they 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 know they're in for a ride. Yeah. You know, and they know they're in for something like a little bit different. You know, and I don't I don't think I'm that out there. I don't think I'm that like crazy as opposed to some of like the people that I've been inspired by, but you know, I'm sort of that controlled chaos. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, I love it. And and a perfect example of kind of your style and kind of the vision that you bring is your camera bag. And you brought this for us to check out today. But this is actually Kwong's camera bag. And we're gonna we're gonna show you guys some close ups of this. But uh, check this out. It's like Indiana Jones style leather. And you designed this for a company, a company actually came to you and said, design a bag, right? Yeah, they, you know, I had worked with this company in, in a different form in the past. And they had known me sort of for the ridiculousness. Yeah. And I you know, they basically gave, said, do whatever you want. And I and I thought about it really hard. And I actually went over to the Sammy's camera um, in Orange County. And I was, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty good friends with the guys over there. And we were just talking. And I, I was going down. I was like, you know what? They ha- There's a camera bag here for every situation. Yeah. I don't want to make a bag like this. I want to make something that's like so out there, but not like, not just crazy but like something that i'd want to keep forever i think it's it's that awesome it's that fun and so these guys from a company called first and company allowed me to to sort of design and create you know a a camera bag that i felt it was inspired by a lot of my traveling yeah i mean this is a lot of the history that i i don't know if you guys can see this super closely but this is a sick bag dude i mean it's essentially designed like i don't know what i can relate it to i mean it's like part indiana jones part like jewelry part like luxurious you know just felt and everything it's kind of a mixture of everything but it's an awesome bag yeah it's it it was something i I did a a campaign for a shoe company called creative recreation and they had sort of let me just kind of run amok and create imagery and one of the trips we took was for was to egypt cairo when they basically gave me the opportunity to sort of pick out some stuff or work with them on locations I always kind of went for what I would call like Indiana Jones or James Bond <laughs> cities. Like it was never like those like, oh, let's go to Tokyo or let's go to like London or, or like Ireland or something like that. I always chose like Cairo, and <laughs> Kenya, Tanzania, like just countries that were sort of out there that were like, you know, a little bit more adventurous. And that sort of kind of helped inspire this because I, you know, I grew up watching those kind of things and like being super interested in like kind of like Victorian era yeah. um, kind of stuff as well as like adventure movies and things. And and so there wasn't anything out there that was remotely close to this. Yeah. So my goal was sort of to create something that like if I lived back then, what I would want. You yeah. know, sort of like, you know, I, I have a funny like a file on my desktop of all these different things that inspire this. And even Jack the Ripper, like his <laughs> sort of like what – you know, with the legends and the stuff, like, he had this, like, accessory kit that, like, would carry all his knives and all his little <laughs> things. And that, that sort of was a factor as well, as well as, like, there's a movie called The Professional that there's a scene where he opens this case and there's all these guns and stuff. So it was like, how do I fit all my little pieces, yeah, like, the tools of my trade into, like, this little case that I would um sort of have? And I, you know, there's always some sort of, like, thing about, like, how somebody carries themselves, like, whether it's, like, like the pageantry and the mysticism. Mm-hmm. And I always imagine like 
getting on a plane with just this and like a long coat and every, you know, and like people just kind of tripping out. <laughs> Wonder like, what this like, guy what, does. What is this? You know, and it's it's part of, you know, given the opportunity, that's why I wanted to do it. It's like, not that I'd ever really appear like that, but it's like in my mind, you know, sort of like if I could shoot a campaign that revolved around this, what would it look like? And yeah. it, it would look like any of those like fantastic ads where you see somebody just getting on top of like, getting in a locomotive and like there's like steam coming out and like you know that that kind of imagery so but that's what i love about it is that you know a lot of photographers they uh everyone tries to differentiate themselves right and most people are so stuck on uh kind of focusing on their images and their website and their logo and all this kind of stuff that they kind of forget like just the overall presentation of when you show up and when you when you walked in today and when you came in and you you sat down like there's a presence about you and about like just the way you carry yourself, your style, this bag that you just know you're a creative person. And it kind of is like when like when you walked in, you're like, dude, if I if I had a company and I need a photographer, I would want to hire you. Like that's how it is, because it's like you have that creative vision versus just coming in and here's my business card and please look at my portfolio type thing. This makes you want to hire you without even like looking at your images. And then the fact that we look at your images and you're like, OK, this is pretty sick. That's pretty awesome. So you know, I was. It took me a long time to actually commit to carrying business cards because mm-hmm. I just felt like it was sort of like this weird. It it it, it sort of prevented people from having conversation. Mm-hmm. It was like a weird, like, oh, here's my card, and you know, I would go to trade shows, and for a long time, I actually like cut a little hole in my pocket, mm-hmm. and I would just slide people's business cards in there, <laughs> and they would just fall out of the bottom of my pant leg because it's like. That's not how I want to communicate with people. It's like I like to like hang out. I like to sort of be involved with like, you know, it, it, it's like hands on. I only have like a couple of friends out there, but the people I care about, like they really know that I'd go way out of my way to like make something work for them, make something yeah. happen. It's like, and I feel lucky that like the companies that I've worked for, it's like family. Mm-hmm. You know, I could imagine, you know, I mean, really having the guys from like companies like LRG, like at my wedding. Mm-hmm. You know, like I couldn't have it without them because I care for them that much, and it's grown. The guys from Stands, Skull Candy, whatever. It's like I've I've grown so close, and that's something that I like. I try to put out there where it's not. I'm just not the guy that I'm not a trigger man. You know, there's photographers I I, I you know I think that are out there that are basically just trigger men. Mm-hmm. And you know, I like to come and and I and I like. But when we talked about earlier, I don't totally consider myself a true photographer. I didn't go to school. I don't have all this, like, stuff. I just, I, I see images in my mind, and and I try to just capture that. I, I, I recently sort of had this sort of, like, creative breakdown, and a client kind of, like, I told them about it, and it was basically, I kept telling them how I missed making mixtapes. Mm-hmm. Like, for girls that I, I was dating or girls that I was really <laughs> interested in, there's a whole thing, like, I would make them like a mixtape. I don't know if you remember. Like, I totally remember a mixtape, like, dude. Like, you know, you're with the girl, you're interested in her. And Summer so that, of 94. <laughs> subliminally, like you're making a mixtape yeah. to um, to sort of like to woo her, you know. And, and I was explaining this. I was like, yeah, your campaign should be like about this. The image that it should open with is like somebody holding a tape. Yeah. Like because I feel like your your brand is sort of like retro nostalgic you know i mean those words aren't really words that i like to use but there's something timeless Mm -hmm. and like even though there's a a group of kids out there that don't even know what a a cassette tape is anymore they i think they they kind of do you know it's like you know like it's like vinyl records and stuff it'll never really go away even though you know they may not have done it themselves but they've seen it in movies they know what the concept is and so the client was like wow they're like we you know they've had a whole slew of photographers but never somebody who came to them and like i built a whole rig in my new home like to make mixtapes for girls like <laughs> this girl that i'm like interested in she's just like you know i know she'll, she'll flip out she'll be like what why are you sending me cassette tapes but <laughs> i can't even play this on anything <laughs> but it's like there's just something like you know what am i going to send you my playlist from yeah. my spotify account like yeah. that's there's just something so like lackluster about that like in, no, totally. in, in an email it's like you get that the technology kind of creates that disconnect now that we didn't have back when right you know when you kind of you know it was more I, personalized and more relationship oriented right i like the hands-on sort of, of thing and i think that's like a lot of clients actually like that like mm-hmm. i'm i don't like to do these like crazy emails bouncing back and forth it's like i'll go 
even though it might take me an hour, two hours to get to you, like I'll go wherever and just take that 30 minute, 40 minute meeting because I feel like I get a lot more leeway. Sure. You know, there's a lot more understanding of what I do by being there and having a presence as opposed to like, oh, here's some mood boards that I just picked off. Of. Like I, I just saw something on Pinterest that I think you'd be interested in. It's like that to me is like it's so um, clinical. Like, I don't yeah. know. It just doesn't it doesn't resonate well with me. I, I still like touching and feeling things. Totally. So, so I want to know kind of like maybe we can tell the audience what is an actual day like working with a company like LRG? Like, I mean, when you go in, what are you doing typically? <laughs> Obviously, there's like the shoot days and then there's like the pre-production days. There's, you know, the creative um, meetings and things like that. It And it changes because, you know, and I'm pretty different, I feel like, because everything's very loose. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've had meetings where we just go and we'll just hang out and we'll go to like the shooting range. Mm-hmm. And we'll just hang out, and, and they'll just get a feeling um, for me. Um, a good client, actually, I have is this uh, women's bag company called Cleo Bella. And with Cleo Bella, it's like, it, it's it's really funny because I feel like I'm like I look sort of like an overgrown troll doll <laughs> that, that that's like has hair combed like Elvis or something like that. And it, when I go walk into Cleo Bella, it's like these really beautiful girls yeah. like that work there, and you know I'm fairly short like five six and they're like tall and beautiful and and so you know talking to them and and their mood boards they have a very like ethereal presence about them Mm -hmm. and then I'm sitting there just talking about like garbage like total garbage but somehow it like it works because they 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 sort of sense like the rawness like that I I sort of bring to it and then I'm sort of translating their beauty into Mm -hmm. imagery um, and, you know, we'll look over a bunch of mood boards and, and then I, I get like mentally into the more technical side, coloring, post-production and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But really, it's just spending time and like kind of feeling the personality out. And, and I kind of brought up that client because for the most part, everything I had shot up until recently was natural light because mm-hmm. the bags are all made in, in Bali and, and things like that. And, and for that specific for client. that specific client, like she she's very hands on and she lives in Bali for like a good portion of the year. Yeah. And so, I'll, you know, I had looked at imagery that I had before I had come and I just wasn't I didn't feel it. And for them, I was like, you know what? We need to have these really natural, beautiful models like very light makeup, you know, uh, you know, I have nothing against plastic surgery, but no real plastic surgery. Mm-hmm. There's just something very about, real about it. Like sun kissed. Yeah. You know, and so with them and then, and you know, we talked about it and she was like, this totally makes sense. Your mm-hmm. vision makes sense for the company. And in a way for her, you know, it took me a couple seasons, but I realized that all the, everything that's made or all the outfits should reflect the owner, Angela, who's this really wonderful, um, beautiful woman that like they're all reflections of her Mm -hmm. and so when it came down to looking at their photo shoots and looking at how their brand is created I just look to her every time as guidance it without even talking to her about it Mm -hmm. it's just sort of this thing that I do now and everything's gone easier and on the most recent photo shoot I decided to turn to like hard flashes and and like you know artificial lighting just because I felt like not that anything's really changed but like that the brand sort of like, it, it just like there was like this oomph that I that I wanted to go beyond just the other stuff. It, it like whether it was something in me that changed, I just felt like it was right, and it was just it was unspoken, but it, it's sort of like I just feel out the client, which is sort of like why I, I use a lot of the sort of like personal interaction with them, mm-hmm. and you know it wasn't even something we even talked about, you know I just did it, and then all of a sudden they saw the imagery, they're like wow. This yeah. totally makes sense now. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads me to another question, which is basically like, have you ran into a situation where you're with a client, you kind of think of a vision for them, you present it, you might take a few sh- photos, show them in a mood board, and it doesn't fly, and they're not cool with it. What do you do in those kind of, have you had that situation? If so, what do you do in those situations? I think I'm pretty good at reading people uh-huh. um, and reading what a client wants, and, and that's where it really is important for a mood imagery prior Mm -hmm. and not that i'm trying to knock anything off but it's like if i can find out what that their personal taste is yeah it's a very good way for me to sort of gauge what i'm doing um so you're making sure like i mean there's plenty of pre-planning and 
And are you doing some of these mood boards as well yourself? By the way, mood boards, maybe you can just explain. I know we keep talking about mood boards, but some people yeah. might not know what they are. So um, Mood boards, I mean, have changed over the years. But basically at this point now, I think for most photographers, it's like, your favorite pics file from other photographers that appears on um, your desktop. You know, yeah. I have a, I have actually an icon on my on my desktop that says pics I dig, mm -hmm. and then I just drag. You know, there's probably thousands of different photos, and I have them split up into subcategories of like different styles. Yeah, and... different styles. For me, it actually falls into different seasons. Mm. Like the color, I like this. You know, certain coloring, and I'll yeah. I'll put that in my spring summer sort of file or my fall holiday if mm -hmm. it's dark and more moody. Um, but yeah, that's it's something that I think that everybody has in one way or another. I mean, yeah. it could just be photos you like, but you know, for a lot of companies, it's also where they get design inspiration and things like that. And that's something that like I like to see. You mm -hmm. know, I'll I'll pretty much force a client into producing that because it's almost like an insurance policy. It's like for sure. if I know what kind of imagery they're interested in, then there's no going wrong. You yeah, just... it's like not that I'm. I am knocking somebody off, but it's just mm. sort of like I understand where their mindset is at. Definitely. You know, whether it is artificial lighting, whether it is natural lighting, whether it's just like soft focus kind of stuff or like, you know, very hyper realistic things. So generally you're starting with their mood board. Are you presenting kind of a modified one later on saying this is kind of your vision incorporate with mine? The first meeting, let's say if it's a company that I've never met with before, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do a little back homework, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go back maybe, you know, a couple years or, or figure out if, if like who the creative director I'm working with and find out what companies they've come from and kind of do a little homework on them. Mm -hmm. And then I'll sort of feel it out for a moment, see if it's something that I'm interested in. And then I'll go meet with them and then see kind of where their heads are at. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it's like we just go out to lunch and we'll just kind of rap about like stuff we like mm -hmm. you know and it's it's like a first date yeah and then it's like the next time around it's like hey like why don't you send me a couple of things you're into let's see what you like you know and then we just kind of shoot around concepts and ideas and then and then usually it, it probably like third or fourth meeting like face to face it's like okay now now we sort of have like a a, a language and a dialogue between each other mm -hmm. to where it like makes sense where mm -hmm. we where we can converse and like we understand each other's language. Yeah. So. Well, I love that because we've talked a lot before basically about how important pre-planning is with every client. Doesn't matter if you're doing weddings or you're doing commercial or whatever it is, you got to get them sit, you know, sit them down, have your mood board. We do the exact same thing with a mood board. We use Pinterest for ours. We have our clients go pin the images that they like and they right. dig from everyone, put together a mood board, discuss it. And, and we spend probably a good two, three hours before every shoot going through their mood board. And then, right. When you come back, there's the chances of you, I mean, basically the only way you're not going to get something that they'd like is your own bad type thing. But if you know what you're doing, then you're good at right. that point. And you can never, like you said, nobody can ever fault you for giving them what they gave you, basically. For me, like actually taking the picture is the most boring part about it. Mm -hmm. It's it's everything building up to that point. Yeah. And then once I appear on set and like everything's like lit and then like my sample photos there. It's like done. Like yeah. I, I'm like bored and I'm ready to move on to the next thing. Well, I imagine it's also very quick too. Like, I mean, the shooting part is probably such a small, minute portion of the actual overall everything. I mean, from the pre-planning to the lighting to the direction and creative and makeup and all that kind of stuff. And then you just click a photo. And then... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's pretty funny, like how, how quick it goes. And, and a lot of companies now really take advantage of all the production and they produce videos and things yeah. that, I, that I have a, a little hand in that um, it, it makes it more fun. Yeah. You know, because now there is, like, storytelling Behind involved. Behind the scenes. And like, and, yeah. There's, yeah. There's a lot of other things, and, and I think that that's, that's kind of, like, a cool element that, that, I, that I enjoy sort of participating in now with photo shoots. Um, but, yeah, it's, like, every, it's pre-production is everything. Yeah. You know, and I learned that when I was working on the film stuff and, you know, even with the band and everything like that. It was, like... The performance was such like a, a small part of it. It, yeah. was, it was all about making sure everything worked flawlessly from the beginning. Yeah. Um, there's actually a photo shoot that I did um, for Skull Candy featuring this girl named Victoria Asher from a band called Cobra Starship. And we went to New York and we rented this like really great um, 
it was like an old safe. Mm-hmm. It was like a bank safe. And I, I just had this idea and she had these custom, these really like sort of like groovy, like custom dresses that, um, that she had done for the photo shoot. And I, I couldn't sleep. I like freaked out and we basically set up in the hotel room, um, the lighting situation that I wanted. And I had, I, I woke up my assistant and I was like, Hey, stand there, do this. And he's like, are you serious? <laughs> Like, like we, we drew it out on paper. We did this all day and I was, and I'm like, this is just how I am. It's like, I freaked out and I just wanted to make sure everything was perfect yeah. so that right when we got on, on the set, it was like, it was already done. It was yeah. done in my mind. I knew what was going to happen. And the only thing what like the only like thing was like, okay, now what's Victoria going to do? Yeah, like yeah. what? Are, what are her movements? How is she gonna pose? How can I direct her better? Mm-hmm. But it was like this really funny instance. That like, you know, uh, you know, I, I I recall the image in my mind of just these power packs being run all over this hotel room, and then my uh, assistant at like four in the morning just like just like looking as grumpy as can be. But like, <laughs> you know, I think he was just laughing because inside he's like, man, he's like he's always making me do these dumb things. Well, while you're talking about this, what's impressive to me, too, is that you said you didn't really have formal photography training yet. I mean, just in hearing you speak, I know you're versed with every type of lighting and every type of gear and every type of whatever it is. How did you kind of grow into that formal training that you didn't, I mean, you didn't go to school, so how did you get that training? In college, I I was part of this film program, and, and I was sort of blessed with, like, teachers that were like, wow, this kid is so weird. Mm-hmm. Like... And he's, he's just so into everything he's into. We're just going to let him run amok and do whatever you want. So they actually let me take... I took three photo classes at okay. Cal State Fullerton and didn't do any of the assignments. <laughs> you know, because, like, you know, when you go to, like, photo school, I was, you know, a, an assignment would be, like, circles. Take a bunch of... Take a yeah. picture of a bunch of circles. And I'm like, why? Why would I do this? I kind of just wanted to, like, be able to use the computer lab and, like, <laughs> use the lights and all this other stuff. And I really didn't care about college at all. Um, and, it, and I just noticed that like in these photo classes were like really cute girls. Yeah. So I was kind of there to like hang out with like, and actually this one girl in particular that I was just chasing around basically school for these three classes. Um, and then, um, you know, just using all their gear as well. And so at this point when I was like doing the Ruka stuff, I, I had like a meltdown, a complete meltdown, like after, um, you know, it was during the summer break. Mm -hmm. And I basically just sat in my room and I had like these little toys that I collected and with like hot lamps and we just light them like different directions. And I would just take different, take photos of them, like different focal lengths, different apertures, different everything, just so that going back into this next year and then these next seasons of like doing photo shoots for people, I would kind of know. And it was funny because my mom would like, she's like freaked out. (laughs) She's like, you're, you don't leave, you don't eat, you don't go anywhere. Like, you're just sitting there, like, with your toys and you're just taking, taking pictures, pictures of them. And I'm like, and, you know, I just figured that if I could figure this out on this little scale, yeah. all I needed to do is bring it up to, like, a grand. Same like, principles apply. Yeah, it's, it's just lighting. And then I, there was, um, you know, I, I'm always really interested in, like, old photography, um, like the glamour portraits. And then mm-hmm. there's this one book I bought, and I, I wish I could remember the title. I'll, I'll have to, like send it to you guys and send it and we'll put in the notes but it was like how to take glamour portraits from like you know the classic hollywood days and there's mm. like photos of errol flynn and then there's this great there's these great photographers that would sit and draw lighting schematics mm-hmm. like we weren't there we don't know but looking at this image of you know um whoever it was marilyn monroe errol flynn whomever like this is what we assume was the lighting situation. Yeah. So I would read that and kind of like download this information and be like, okay, they use this light. There's a kicker here. There's a hair light. Yeah. And I sort of, and I learned the dialogue through just reading simply this one book. Yeah. You know, and, and so when I, when I meet like photographers now, I use sort of this like antiquated language that doesn't really exist anymore. <laughs> like, like just old like photography terms. I remember like, telling him like I was like oh well maybe we need some Vaseline to put on the side of the lens and they're like are you crazy <laughs> like what, what are you talking why about why would you put Vaseline I was like yeah it's to soften this to give like a dream effect and they're you know they, they wondered if I, if I climbed out of a time machine or something yeah I, I actually learned Photoshop 
um, through the help of my friend um, Parker Jacobs and Tyler Jacobs, mm-hmm. uh, they were working at uh, Paul Frank, mm-hmm. the clothing company, mm-hmm. and I had made an action figure of my little sister um, with a, uh, and then a character from the Planet of the Apes, uh, Cornelius. Mm-hmm. And I made action figures of both of them, and they needed packaging. It was yeah. like to have a weird doll of your little sister just lying around was <laughs> a like creepy. a little weird, and, and and as a gift. And so I, I made like packaging, and they were very busy doing what they were doing, so they couldn't really design it for my for me. So they were just like, "Hey, we're gonna teach you some basic Photoshop things, and figure it out for yourself." And that was like my my training in Photoshop. Like yeah. I had these really great teachers you know some of the best graphic designers you know out there they were just sort of like okay like this is how the transform tool works this is how this works this is like your healing brushes and all these sort of little things um and they were just showing me i was like as they were doing the like you know design work i Mm -hmm. was sitting on like a laptop or something like that next to them just figuring it all out that's really cool dude i mean to come to kind of the level that you are now and to think back that you learned a lot of these techniques just kind of what I would say, just MacGyvering it, like just putting together whatever you got at the time and trying to figure it out. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty scary because, like, I have <laughs> friends now that are like really amazing at what they. They're like, I, I still am perplexed by like how they do what they do, and then they look at how I'm doing it, and they're like, you, like they. It, it's just like a funny thing, like, yeah. Because I've sort of just invented processes, and you know, there is really like thousands of ways to get to one place there it totally is but i feel like i have the most roundabout like long way possible to get to it but it's what makes me feel comfortable like i've tried using different techniques and stuff and it just it doesn't seem to get the same results that i like yeah it works for you dude yeah and the thing is that um you know the funny thing is that if you go to i have a lot of friends that are actually in film they make movies i talk to them about camera stuff and they're like oh like, I'm like, well, how do you shoot? Like, do you set the wipe out? I don't, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know what that is? You're, you're a director. How do you not know what? He's right. like, uh, uh, I think we use this. Like, they literally know nothing about the cameras. Like, I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, well, I direct. So, I mean, I have the kind of the creative vision for it. I, I know what I want. And I have the right people right. in the right places that are doing what I want, you know, for the scene. Right. So you kind of take that different approach. But then you have the more technical directors, too, that are, very much hands-on like with every single little thing they know all the cameras they know everything and and there's no one right way i mean you have plenty of technical directors that are amazingly successful and plenty of non-technical directors and so it's it's kind of again reiterates the point that there's more than one way to skin a cat right i mean you do what works for you and this definitely has worked for you i just feel super blessed and really lucky that like i've sort of found a way to channel like kind of what I see in my head Mm -hmm. out there and and get it out there for people to hopefully enjoy you know that's like I said it's like it's a it's a pretty funny thing and I feel really fortunate to be able to like just have that you know Mm -hmm. and that's that's why I don't look at any form of photography different than another like I actually think that like to be a wedding photographer would be kind of like my nightmare because I, (laughs) I feel like I'm a very selfish like a photographer and I don't really interact with other people that well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I have friends that are wedding photographers and they, you know, they're, they always, you know, whatever, put me on a high horse of some sort. I'm like, no man, like I think your job is way crazier because I wouldn't know how to deal with like a bride on her most important day of her life. Yeah. Like, you know, and she needs to look a certain way. Like I, I try to shoot, you know, I'm dealing with a creative director who's shooting a model that he probably hates, but she thinks that looks like looks fantastic. You know, there's Has like the right look. And so you just deal with it. Yeah. It? <laughs> it's like a totally different thing. You know, there isn't that kind of psychology involved. Yeah. You know, so that's something like that. I, I try to push out there and I tell people, I'm like, man, it, like each form of the art has its own like set. Oh, of, I fully agree. Of, of, of rules. Skills and it's, and... Yeah. It's like no one person is like, should be really like valued more than another or anything yeah. like that. It's 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 pretty difficult. I mean, I I had somebody even yesterday like approach me about doing something, and I I just was like, I can't. Yeah. I I can't shoot anything that you guys will personally appear into. I don't want to have your girl crying and like all this stuff. I, I was like, you know, that kiss between so and so, like that one opportunity. It's like. It's stressful. <laughs> it, it's so much stress. It's like I, I just don't know how to, I don't know how to deal with it. I'd rather deal with you know 
traveling to Africa, you know, going through all that stuff, working with the people out there, like, you know, being almost attacked by animals and stuff like that is way more my style. See, when I think of that, that stresses me out, dude. Like, here's, I, I always tell people that, look, you know, you could have the best wedding photographer in the world. You put him in a situation where he's doing fashion or editorial and they're going to be terrible. Like, they could take great pictures in that situation. And vice versa, you take the greatest editorial photographer in the world, you put him in a wedding or, or sports photography situation and they're just going to completely, like, they know their stuff, but it's a completely different skill set. And that really dawned on me when, uh, I mean, I shoot weddings, as most of you know, that's kind of my thing. And I have no, like, give me a group of 50 people and I'll organize them to a beautiful shot and I'll light it and do everything. Give me like three models and a creative director and I start getting really stressed out. And I've done these commercial shoots and it's stressful to me. And I was in one situation, that this was a totally different type of photography and it's kind of a tangent, but uh, my friend got me on the sideline of a football game. Um, and it was a college game, University of Utah versus San Diego. And he's like, I got you a sideline pass. You can go bring your stuff and shoot. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm going to get some great shots. <laughs> and like, I get down in the field with my telephoto lens and my monopod. And then I'm like shooting a picture. And like, literally the other photographers are like running to be in places. And I'm like, crap, I can't get the right shot. Like I, I was always 50 steps behind. They're always right in the middle of the action. I'm trying to like figure out where's the action going? Where's the ball? I got like one good shot in like an hour and a half. Dude. Right, right. And these guys are just like killing it. I'm like, this is so completely different than what I do. So every arena has its own skill set and challenges, and you got to pick what you like best, right? The one thing I learned with the, the classes I took is is sort of just trying to figure out how to like voice what you do, mm -hmm. you know, because you know I feel like a lot of photographers want to be everything to everybody, mm -hmm. and that's possible. That's where you you kind of screw up. Yeah, like. I kind of know my lane mm -hmm. and I kind of stay there and I do the best I can. And, and people seem to come to me for work Yeah. where like, I remember when I was first starting out and I was like, man, I need to really make money. I need to really like do all this other stuff. And I was like taking anything, mm -hmm. anything that I could get. And I just, I was like chasing jobs. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I get calls like every day, like, Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Because when people want a particular thing, they just go and look for that one guy that does it. Exactly. They you look know. for the specialist. And that's what that's what we realized too. And uh, yeah, I mean, you have photographers that specialize in just shooting liquids. Right. Like that's it. Right. All they do. So uh, and I want to ask one last question, which is talking about a gear standpoint. I know you know how to use everything. I know you do use everything. But if there was, say, just a few pieces of gear that you had to take on a shoot and that's all you had, like let's say you're going to Africa and you're doing a fashion shoot and you had to be kind of minimalistic, you just had maybe one or two lenses, a body, um, one or two types of lights, what would be in your set? I guess like what I take in this, <laughs> this is the would be it. Um, and I, I, you know, the 24 to 70, the Canon yeah. um, L series is like, it's, it's pretty much like the backbone because it just sort of fits. So like, you shoot Canon with most of your stuff then? Yeah, I, I, I was really fortunate um, at some point when the when the 5D Mark II came out, I, I was a huge Nikon fan. Yeah. Um. I there's something a lot quicker about them that I loved, and I loved their like focusing and everything. Mm -hmm. But the 5D Mark II came out. It pretty much like was the camera that like everybody freaked out about, and it's it's a great camera. And I had a client that loved it so much. They're willing to basically anything I bought. They're willing to pay half for. That's crazy. That's awesome. So dude. I went out and got a, another credit card. And just bought everything that I ever thought that I would need, and they <laughs> just had they had they c cut me a check for half. So right. so your twenty four seventy your your body, which right now are you on a Mark two or Mark three or I I switch between the Mark two Mark three. I, I, okay. I have a little little funny things like that I'm not so into on the Mark three, but yeah. you know I'm I just just getting used to it. Okay. Um, and then I'm a huge ad like huge fan of fifties. Yeah. You know, I mean, I like the other ones, the 85 and the 35 and stuff, but like the 50 is like. That's my favorite lens too. When I, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of students and they have all these like fancy like zooms and stuff. And I'm like, dude, you just sell that, get really good with this one lens mm -hmm. and everything else will fall into place. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of does everything that you want it to do. So I, I have a space built into this specifically for that. Um, and then. I'm a huge fan of like glass filters. 
Mm-hmm. I know I know it's like another like weird antiquated system. <laughs> um, it's not. We use filters too. But what, it, what kind of filters are you typically using? Like like sunset kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like um, you color know, grades. Like yeah, that. Uh-huh. yeah, it's things like that. Because I feel like when it comes time to like post production, it's like you can sort of tell when somebody's like going in with their white balance and getting really heavy handed with it. Yeah, yeah. And I almost like to throw those in there and then like tweak it out a little bit so that the coloring is like it, it's like imperfect mm-hmm. like you know when you whenever you're working in the computer it's like the, it's like a blanket effect mm-hmm. like everything is all of a sudden magically warmer you know and I and I and I just like some some sort of like the flaws mm-hmm. in it and, and so I'll use like these filters and things like that to sort of like give it that little bit of like flavoring and then I'll just go and post and then I tweak mm-hmm. it a little bit more to push it but not have it look just so um I guess predictable, mm-hmm. you know, and that those I love those, you know, the, you know, whatever like the Canon five eighty EX flash, mm-hmm. and you know, and I think I'm pretty good with that, you know, if I can take a reflector with me, cool, you know, I, I remember b- basically going to Africa with just that that kind of setup, yeah, because there was like a weight allowance because we had to take these little mud skipper planes, oh yeah yeah, yeah. and so basically it's like anything I could fit on my body. Yeah. Like, and I had one of those, like, really nasty, like, safari guy vests, like, photo- photographer vests. And there was, like, every pocket had, like, more batteries, more everything. And I'm, like, I just felt like like the funniest, like, photographer out there <laughs> just because I was just, like, completely loaded up with gear um, because there was a weight allowance on yeah. what I could take. And I, and I couldn't bring these, like, heavy rollers filled with, like you know pro photo packs and all yeah. this other stuff so that was kind of it that that's kind of like my run and gun yeah you know 24 to 70 50 like you know flash maybe like a little arm bracket or something like that the uh i like this that uh, cb mini rc or whatever mm-hmm. little arm guy that they're pretty cool i think cb makes some pretty good ones well, that's awesome dude i love i love what you do and uh and i've seen a lot of your photo shoots and when i see the equipment that went behind it i'm amazed at how creative you can be with such little gear uh, in a lot of these situations and so we really, really appreciate you coming out here today you guys be sure to check out his website we'll have all the links and the information below and uh thanks again dude for stopping by yeah of course thank you for having me it was, it was awesome it's it's uh it's rare to actually talk to other like photographers it's usually more of like creatives or something like that so it's kind of cool to actually like get to nerd out a little bit yeah dude we appreciate it so we'll see you guys next time yeah